Thanks for stopping by. This is the Zarbo Audio Projects YouTube channel. I'm Thomas, and this is the Mind 65 Bluetooth Radio. We're going to talk about this next. Well, in my last video, which was actually my first video, I told you that we were going to talk about this, the Mind 65 Bluetooth Radio. I know that's a crazy name for a radio, right? Why did I call it that? Well, it uses the Dayton Audio ND65 full range driver, and it's a mini radio. So when you put the two together, uh, when, when you put the two together, I, I can't get this to work. Anyway, just use your imagination for a second. When you put the two together, you get the Mind 65 Bluetooth radio. I'll get the hang of this eventually. Anyway, before I get into too much about how I built this, I think it's probably important to talk about why I built it. Every story that a man can tell usually has a backstory, and this one is no different. I never tried to make a truly tiny radio before, and I thought I was probably due to give it a shot. So last year, I finally designed and built a very small Bluetooth radio. Battery powered, no less. I guess my inspiration came from a friend of mine who has one of those Bose SoundLink radios. I've always been impressed with the sound of that thing, especially for its size, because I loosely based the design of my radio on the Bose SoundLink radio that my friend has. Actually, mine ended up being quite a bit bigger than the Bose version, but I did the best I could. I'm not a multi-million dollar company, you know, so... This darker rosewood veneered radio uses the Visiton BF37 driver and a passive radiator on the back. And this lighter colored radio uses the Dayton Audio DMA45 driver, again with rear-facing passive radiators. Both of these radios use the fantastic all-in-one amp from Parts Express that I reviewed in my first radio. It's a winner, trust me. Well, I really like the sound that both of these radios produce, but, of course, as usually happens with us do-it-yourselfers, I started thinking of ways to improve upon that design. Yeah, they sound great for tiny radios, but I wondered what I could do with a slightly larger, more powerful driver. I knew I'd have to make the enclosure a bit bigger to accomplish that, but I still wanted to keep it fairly compact. And that brings me to the Dayton Audio ND65-4 driver. Now, this driver is an old friend of mine. I've used this before in several projects, including my Sound Travelers project and the Tony Table Radio projects from several years back. But those projects were quite a bit bigger and used vented enclosures to get into the high 60 hertz range. I wanted this design to be much smaller than those. So I modeled the ND65 driver in WinISD, which is a speaker modeling program, and I found that if I used a matching passive radiator, I could get reasonable bass output in a pretty small enclosure. The trade-off would be less bass than they're capable of, but would have quite a bit higher available output than the other two small radios I had built previously. And that's a fair compromise, I felt, because to be honest, if I'm not careful, I can totally destroy the drivers in either of those other two little radios if I wasn't careful. So I worked up an enclosure size for the ND65 and passive radiator combination. And then I figured out how much space I would need to house the amplifier. And then also the three cell battery board that I wanted to use with this project. The Parts Express sells a ready to go battery charger board that's perfect for mid-size radios and boom boxes. Probably a bit overkill for a small radio like this. You can purchase this battery board in several variations. This particular package comes with three high quality 18650 batteries, as well as the power supply to power it and charge it with. The problem I was having as I sketched this thing out was that because of the size of the battery board, it was starting to get a little bit bigger than I really wanted it to be. So the solution I came up with was something that I've done in the past to reduce the visual impact of an enclosure. And that is to create a smaller base unit on the bottom to raise and tilt up the radio, to aim it more towards ear level. If you make the base a bit smaller than the main closure and black it out, kind of disappears, and you really only see the main body of the radio. 
but you still get the extra space that that base provides. Yeah, we're tricking the eye here a little bit, but it works. And now I can cram all the stuff in there that I need to get this radio to work. As you can see from the pictures, I basically created two smaller enclosures on the sides for the speaker volume. And I left the middle section open to the bottom so all the bits could fit in there and I'd have space to assemble everything when I was ready to put it all together. That battery board, it sits vertically in the middle while the amp board is mounted in the base on the rear towards the side. Now, I had originally intended to rewire the volume potentiometer so that I could have a really nice looking volume knob on the front. But <laughs> I ruined one of the boards with my less than perfect soldering skills. And although I did get the second board to work, there was some noise, which is fairly common when trying to modify small devices like this. If I had a dime for every time I had to wire in an isolation transformer to deal with some kind of noise issue, I'd, well, I'd probably have 40 cents at least. But anyway, I'm left with a big hole on the front of this thing above the power switch, which I'll probably fix by putting an LED light in there so it doesn't look like I messed up, which I totally did. I should have tested the remote volume potentiometer out fully before drilling that hole in the cabinet, but, well, lesson learned there, I hope. I used one quarter inch MDF wood purchased from Home Depot to build this with. Rather than give exact dimensions, I'm just showing you more about how I went about designing and building this contraption. So here's what the insides of the radio looks like before screwing the bottom base on to seal up all the wires and stuff. Yeah, it's a real bird's nest in there. But rather than cut several inches out of all the pre-wired harnesses that the battery board comes with, I decided to just leave them be as long as there were no noise or interference issues, which thankfully there were not. Then here's the back with a newly drilled out hole for the volume knob since my experiment didn't work, the USB input for playing MP3s off of a flash drive, and the 3.5 millimeter input for connecting to a computer or other device. The infrared receiver, well that's been cut off, extended with wire leads, and moved to the front where it will be able to receive the output from the remote control. Also, here's the included button and lights for the battery monitor. Press that button and it will give you one, two, three, or four lights to tell you the state of the battery charge. Now that weird thing that looks like a sink drain on the back, that's actually called a soffit vent. And they make those to allow for airflow in areas that are traditionally closed up. Well, I wanted to provide a bit of ventilation for the amplifier and the battery charging board in case it ever did get a little warm in there. And that soffit vent just press fits into the appropriate sized hole. So to make life easy, I just drilled out a hole in the soffit vent to mount the DC input barrel jack that you need to charge the batteries. Yep, we're working smarter here, not harder. Well, that's pretty much it for the guts. I painted the base with Rust-Oleum texture paint, and then I painted it black. Two screws secure it to the main cabinet. A few rubber feet on the bottom keep it from scratching up any nice table finishes, as well as prevent it from vibrating around once the party guests arrive. The veneer is some leftover teak that I had from another project. Notice I did try to match up the front and the top grain so that it looks like one continuous piece. Depending on how much veneer you have, this may or may not be possible, but it's a nice touch when you can do it. I have some videos on my other channel on how to use veneer and how to do the iron-on method. They're old and they're a little hard to watch as I really didn't know what I was doing back then. But there is some good information to be found there if you're patient. So I'll put links to them if I can figure out how to do that. Well, how does it sound? Actually pretty dang good. This radio plays a lot louder than the other two which was my main goal with this version. The three 18650 batteries also allow for a ridiculously long playing time, possibly days if you keep the volume reasonable. Here's an example of it in use in our bedroom. Here I am a good 20 feet away from the radio. It's hard to even see it. I'm gonna press play, let you see what it sounds like nice and loud. Maybe it doesn't sound that loud, but in the room it's pretty loud. Get you a little closer.
a good 20, 22 feet away or so. Not bad. No one's going to call the police on me, but not bad. Here's my trusty old Radio Shack SPL meter to give you an idea of how loud it is from 10 feet away where I'm standing. If you like this video, please feel free to leave a comment down below and let me know how I'm doing. I hope you enjoyed this look into how and why I built this particular radio. And if you still think the do-it-yourself audio is the stuff of nerds and geeks, then take a look at this. That's my wife in that last panel, by the way, a few years ago. See, nice guys don't always finish last. Those are just a few of the projects that I built over the years. And you know, back when I started all those years ago, maybe when I was 12 years old and 50 now, I didn't know too much and I knew it. I decided the best thing to do was just to jump in with both feet and give it a try. And I think you should too, because you never know what you can do till you try. See you next time. What?